Welcome back to Ether Hour, everybody. I'm your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dimitri Kalyagin, and we are joined by a very special guest today, someone we've been trying to get on the show for a very long time. I'll have her introduce herself in a moment, but this is our sort of World War Now Ether Hour hybrid episode. We're going to be discussing everything going on in the Levant and Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, the Zionist entity, all these places where currently Israeli forces are invading Lebanon, Israeli strikes are ongoing across the region and rumors of an Israeli strike possibly on Iran's nuclear capabilities or their oil facilities with the potential assistance of the United States is on its way. So we're going to be analyzing all of this, talking about even some of the prophetic elements, as well as, of course, analyzing the on the ground situation in the Middle East from somebody who is from the region. So we're going to introduce them in one second. Dimitri, how are you doing? Doing great, Conrad. It's good to be on this special episode with an info warrior of many years, somebody we've been actually following since, I suppose, our youth in this movement, following her journalistic works for a long time on RT. Info was, of course, contributing to all these worldwide alternative media publications with a very concrete conservative and I would say Syrian nationalist, nationalistic, patriotic view of what's taking place in the Middle East. And yeah, just really good to have you on because at the moment, that particular region of the world, your homeland is under attack by the entity, which we'll discuss in depth on this particular episode, getting into the history and I'm sure covering the news, which is actually taking place as we make this recording. Yes. So if you haven't guessed already, we're joined by Syrian girl. You may know her. She's on X at Partisan Girl. Me and her became quite good friends in Russia. We've been in touch ever since and we've been hoping to do this show for a long time. And I think with everything exploding right now in the Middle East regarding World War III, I didn't think there was a better time. So, Maram, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, it's, it's great to have you on finally. And we've been in some spaces together and we've talked about this. And I always check your page when I want to learn about Syria or Lebanon. And if you want to just anybody that, you know, isn't on X or hasn't watched your programs or seen anything or even seen what I was posting when I was with you in Russia. Could you maybe introduce yourself, tell people your background, why you are an expert on this topic and the conflict in the region and just let people know who you are and what you're all about? Well, thanks, guys. My name is Syrian Girl. I actually studied chemistry at university to the level of PhD. But the reason I am so getting more professional work in the Department of Politics and News it's because I've been a very close follower of the news since I was a teenage girl and even before that. And I have been focusing on wars in the Middle East mainly, but also geopolitics as a whole, regional wars in the east of Europe and in Far East Asia. So I have written for RT, al Medin, English, Press TV, Infowars, I started making videos on my YouTube channel, Syrian Girl Partisan, in 2012. I make predictions about the future. I've also written for a think tank, New Eastern Outlook. So these are the things that are now, like, now I'm kind of really doing a lot of Twitter spaces and tweets, focusing on that, because I do prefer Elon Musk's Twitter to the previous iteration. So here we are. No, that's amazing. And of course, with the recent news outbreak regarding Syria, I think you've been covering your homeland very closely. I mean, you're a big supporter of Bashar al-Assad, I believe. And with that, I think the sort of view that Syria, this war-torn country, I think with that particular instantiation, we've been following, of course, the development of ISIS over the last 10 years, this sort of psyopy Mossad, you know, Mossad originating organization. Can you give us some background into what exactly took place in Syria over a decade ago? I'm sure some of our listeners were following the news back then, but just a brief summary of what happened to your particular homeland and how was Israel, the Zionist entity, actually involved in that? Because I'm sure it ties into the fact that Israel at the moment we see is flying sorties all over Syria and kind of bombing it at the same time as the bombing of Tripoli, Beirut, and southern Lebanon is taking place. How is Syria, the next door neighboring country, also a victim of Zionist aggression? And where does that sort of come from? Absolutely. Well, here's the thing I wanted to say as well, that you kind of stated that, you know, I'm a big supporter of Bashar al-Assad. And whilst I commend him and support him in this war that's being waged on Syria and the fact that he has been, you know, solid against the Zionists and the U.S. intentions to break apart 
bond between Syria and Palestine, like he stuck his neck out for the resistance and I support him for all those things. It's not necessarily the case that someone has to be a diehard supporter of Assad to support the side of the war that is actually on the nation's side. You know, we chose our country over this foreign aggression that tried to tear it apart. And there's lots of people that even maybe we didn't start off as being pro-Assad that have taken the side of Assad in this war. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now, what led to this war? What you guys have to understand is the whole Arab Spring was kind of like a CIA color revolution agenda. So General Wesley Clark said that he wants to destroy seven, not he wants to destroy, that there was a plan to destroy seven countries in seven years. And the countries that he included were Afghanistan, Iraq, I believe it was Libya, Iran, Syria, and Sudan. Okay, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and, and Iran, and Iraq. Okay, so Somalia, done. Sudan, done. Libya, they did. Iraq, they did. Lebanon is now happening. And finishing off with Iran is the agenda. So why these countries? Because those are the countries that they couldn't get to agree to make peace treaties with Israel. Saudi Arabia and UAE and Qatar have clearly been way, way more inclined to make peace treaties with Israel. And my question then, why Egypt? Because Egypt had a peace treaty with Israel under Hosni Mubarak. So why did they target that for regime change? But now you have to understand this, that in order to destabilize Syria, the Americans needed the Muslim Brotherhood to take power in Libya and Egypt. And that is exactly what happened after the revolution. They had Morsi take over, which was the Muslim Brotherhood. And he started saying that we need to start waging a war on Syria. This was part of the plan. So it was like, okay, they were going to destabilize Egypt a little bit just so that they can win in Syria. That was the idea. So why did they want the Muslim Brotherhood to be in power in Syria? Well, the Muslim Brotherhood is close to Turkey and Qatar. Okay, it's not that close to the Saudi Arabia, but Saudis were also like included in this battle against Syria. It was all like coordinated by them. And they were funding all of the terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. All of those Toyota pickup trucks came from Saudi Arabia. And the reason why these countries came together to do this against Syria is because they wanted to break apart something called the Shia Crescent. That's what the Americans call it. Or as we call it, the resistance axis, which is like a weapons supply line that goes from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon and then Palestine. So if you take out one of these countries, then the others will fall. So the Americans and the Israelis, they looked at the map and they're like, which one should we... Well, we've already destroyed Iraq and they still haven't allied themselves with Israel. We can't destroy Iran. It's too strong. Lebanon, we have like a lot of like NGOs in there and we've created many multiple times. They've attempted a civil war in Lebanon so many times, but because Lebanon has already done a civil war, they kind of like don't want to do it again. So. What's left? Syria. Okay. So they needed to overturn Libya under Gaddafi because even though Gaddafi gave up his chemical weapons, he still wouldn't go as far as to recognize Israel. So he gave up his chemical weapons in exchange for peace with the West. And they ended up getting stabbed to death in the streets and lynched. So that goes to show you. But Bashar did not agree to give up his chemical weapons in 2004. So they actually tried to get reproachment with Bashar al-Assad many times. In 2009, they even had him meet, you know, the Fr- in France for the French Day of in- like Independence Day, which I was there that year, by the way, in France. Like, I saw the Syrian motorcade pass me by. It was such an interesting moment. But yes, they, like, he still wouldn't do it, even though they tried to, like, buy him, essentially. And that's when they decided they have to destroy Syria. So they start funding these groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda and ISIS to overthrow the Syrian government and install a regime that would be opposed to Iran. 
And in fact, at the, the very beginning, the protesters were chanting anti-Iran, anti-Christian, anti-minority chants, very sectarian, for no reason at all, because Syria, Iran hadn't done anything to Syria. So they already hated Iran, based solely on the fact that they don't like the religion. And Syria is a secular country, so they don't like the... It's not, maybe it's not secular, it's more pluralist. But, you know, the, like religion is a little bit more separated from government and the way that things are organized because we have so many different religions in Syria. Like we cannot choose and impose one of them on all the others. Unlike, for example, in Iran. So, because, you know, Syria is like 15% Christian. So you can't impose one religion on everybody else. So a lot of people are just like a little bit more westernized. I hate to say, but it's true. And they don't really want to follow things that like stringently. So there's a lot more relaxed government style that these Muslim Brotherhood guys were not pleased by. But the Muslim Brotherhood was a part of this. Like it was at the beginning, they were the major part. But they eventually, like very quickly, actually got swallowed up by Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And they became irrelevant. Because the Muslim Brotherhood is hardly as bad as the other two. They're like Muslim Democrats almost. You know, they, they want to have a vote and like Erdogan style. I mean, I'm not saying he's a good guy, he's a piece of crap, but I'm saying that they're at least not insane like ISIS was, you know? But they were really crushed by ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And eventually there was just ISIS and Al-Qaeda and people who claimed to be the Free Syrian Army, which were affiliated with them and where they were beheading people in the streets, they were blowing up uh, cars, and they were collaborating with Israel on the Syrian border. So... That was happening. And then at the same time, like the US created these false flag chemical attacks. They disarmed Syria of chemical weapons. And only after that did they invade Syria using the claim that they're fighting ISIS as the pretext, even though they were the ones that funded ISIS and destabilized Syria in the first place. And they took over the oil fields and they tried to declare a Kurdistan. And if you notice, they tried to declare a Kurdistan east of the Euphrates River. Even though most Kurds live in the northwest of the country, not the northeast. Anyway, that's because greater Israel is from the boundaries of the Nile to the Euphrates. And here we are, the end. The occupation is still going. The U.S. occupation is still going. Turkey is invaded. Al-Qaeda still controls Idlib province. Israel is taking over the Golan Heights. We don't have chemical weapons. The sanctions are crushing. I think I've said enough. Well, I think that's part of why I've always liked your analysis so much. And I think why people on the show would like it is because you're not orthodox and you have this strictly from a political perspective. And we've talked a lot about the role that Turkey is going to play in greater Israel and how eventually, because of Russia's situation with Iran and these other countries, Russia and Turkey, and well, of course, Turkey's position on the Black Sea and their potential support for Ukraine, that Russia and Turkey are due for an inevitable clash and Syria and Libya are going to be two of the places where proxies are flared up because of these tensions between those two countries. And you have an analysis even very similar to, you know, someone like Igor Girkin Strelkov, who fought in Syria and some of these Russians who have the same perspective because they have been on the ground in Syria. And I think that gets us to, you said a great stage as well for, you said, the axis of resistance and the goal to dismantle it, which Israel is embarking on right now. They're trying to do to the axis, basically, what they did to Hamas in Gaza. And I want to get your thoughts right now. You said you make predictions. That's something that we're in the business of on this show as well. The show is literally about covering the Third World War through the lens of prophecy. So we talk a lot about this. We're, of course, getting very close to the reality of Israel striking potentially Iran's nuclear capabilities, which was prophesied by many a holy elder in the Orthodox Church. So I want to get your thoughts on exactly what's going on on the ground right now. In our previous episode of World War Now, we talk all about the initial probing attacks, the Israeli troops in southern Lebanon. Now we're seeing more full scale, you know, we're hearing reports of hundreds of Israeli soldiers now dead at the hands of Hezbollah. We're hearing reports that Hezbollah has actually made counter incursions down into Israel. We have Israeli strikes all across the country now up in Tripoli. Of course, we have the strikes in Syria. We have rumors of Russian and Syrian Arab army soldiers training near the Syrian Golan. So with all of this stage right now, I want to get your thoughts. What do you think is going to happen? When is Israel going to respond to the Iranian strikes? And 
where do we go from here? How likely do you think that regional war at a full scale level is in our near future? And, you know, how do Russia, the U.S. and everybody else play into the ongoing situation between Syria, Lebanon and Israel on the ground? Well, first part of it, you've mentioned that I am Sunni. So even though I am Sunni, I am telling you things from a very like nuanced, realistic perspective about, you know, Shia Iran. Well, I just also want to say that I am Syrian. So we don't really like sectarianism in Syria. And our Orthodox Christians are part of the mosaic of Syria. So for me, Orthodox Christianity is extremely important. Its survival in our region is part of our history. And all of these wars have been most damaging, actually, to our Christian population. In Iraq, for example, they had like 10% Christians or something. And after the 2003 war, they dwindled to almost nothing. In Palestine, for example, actually, even let's go back a bit to the Golan Heights in Syria. Golan Heights in Syria was 12% Christian. When the Zionists took it over and created the Jewish state in the Levant, which is like JSL, like ISIL, they pushed out and exterminated all of the Christians in the Golan Heights. It burned all the churches. Now it's almost all Jewish. So, you know, it's funny because they say that Islam is like against Christianity in the region. There's nothing that has been more damaging to Christianity in the region than this Jewish ISIS, this Zionism. Yeah, so, it seems that uh, we're way more tolerant of the Druze even than they will of the Christians. Exactly. Exactly. I think that the most intolerant to the Christians, there literally was one village where they purposely burned down that Christian village on Christmas. And for 40 years, they wouldn't allow them to rebuild the church. They don't allow them to rebuild the churches. So the point of the matter is that they create these wars and they fund the people that target the Christians. Obviously, the Christians during the Iraq war, they were more leaning towards supporting Saddam. And in Syria, the Christians are more leaning towards supporting the government because the government actually protects them by virtue of the fact that it's pluralist and they want to maintain the Syrian mosaic, as I called it, rather than these people that were protesting at the start. They were saying, what was it? They did the chant. The chant was Shias to the grave and Christians to Beirut. So when I look at the Orthodox Church, I also look at it in Palestine. I look at how severely damaged it has been because of the creation of Israel. And I really don't think it could have been possible at all if it weren't for the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia that took out the Orthodox Church in Russia. Because I don't think the Orthodox Church in Russia would have stood by and allowed what happened to the Orthodox Church in Palestine to happen where this, that church began. So if you destroy the root of something, then you really kind of like scattered it to the wind, which is why it's so important for the Orthodox Church in Russia to rise again and to protect the Orthodox Church in the Levant. And I'm hoping that that's what's happening. And I'm hoping what I'm seeing in the Golan is a manifestation of that. But I'm afraid we still haven't gotten to the same point as we were during even the Soviet times under Stalin. Because even then, you know, Stalin is very unpopular with certain groups, shall we say, because he kind of rolled back a lot of what the Bolsheviks wanted to do. And he was very pro Syria. Russia did help us a lot in 1973. But, you know, Russia is back, it's coming back. And we're hoping that the Orthodox Church in Russia rises to its former glory and it helps us out as a sisterly nation because. At the end of the day, no matter what race or religion you are, if you know right from wrong, you know that the Levant is being ethnically cleansed. Our land is being taken. And that on its own is not right. You did ask me to make predictions, but I kind of like digressed. So if you want to pose that question again, please do. No, no, no. Yeah, I said a bunch of stuff at the beginning and then asked the question. Not even predictions. Sure, we'd love to hear those. But just let's just dive into some analysis of what's going on right now. I mean, like I said, there's Israeli troops in Lebanon. There's Hezbollah even getting on the ground into Israel. Strikes all across Syria and Lebanon right now. The U.S. and Europe are apparently trying to pull Israel back from doing a strike on Iran's oil facilities or its nuclear capabilities. So I'm just wondering... Where are we going from here? When is Israel going to respond to the big Iranian strikes? It's 
very recently, the second time, of course, that Iran has ever struck Israel now with ballistic missiles. I'm wondering, you know, where do we go from here and what is your analysis right now? So essentially, I did predict that they would assassinate Nasrallah a month before it happened. And people will say, well, that was obvious, you know, but at the time when I said it, People were like, no, like, are you crazy? They wouldn't do something so crazy as that. That's so unlikely and he's well protected, et cetera, et cetera. But I could see it coming a mile away because I could tell that sometime in July, the axis of resistance lost deterrence. I think it was right after the death of the president and the foreign minister of Iran in a helicopter accident. And by the way, those two men did wonders for Russian-Iranian relations, and I don't think they're easily replaced. Russia was really, really made the strongest condemnation of those assassinations, much to the chagrin of Israel. I believe they also, was it one of the officials in Russia attended the funeral? You have to remind me which, was it Medvedev? I'm not sure. In any case, the point is that sometime after that, we lost the turns, and I could tell that Israel was escalating and escalating and doing crazy things like bombing Rafa border, crossing of like tents full of refugees. They were assassinating people. And, um, and then they said something along the lines of, well, then they assassinated Ismail Haniye. Okay. And where they did it is important. They did it inside the IRGC building inside Iran. The place where he actually met Khamenei, which is the supreme leader of Iran. He's like the supreme religious leader of Iran. And I said on... Uh, Mitri Sims' podcast, but I believe this is an indication that they're going to assassinate. It's like a message to Khamenei that if you're not so far from where we can get to you, we can get to someone who met with you in the building that you meet at. So we could do this to you and we could do this to Nasrallah. Also, you know, the problem was that a lot of people, every time an assassination happens, People on social media, I don't know where they're getting their instructions or talking points from, but they come out and they say, well, these assassinations aren't going to change anything. And, you know, the resistance will go on. Like people are, are like uh, basically, you know, they will just get new leaders, we'll get fresh leaders, etc. I understand they're trying to stop people from losing morale. But by making that your reaction, what you're essentially saying is, Anyone is replaceable. So you're opening the door to Nasrallah being assassinated, which is exactly what happens. And even though I knew that that could happen, when it happened, I was still in like a deep shock. And I didn't want to believe that it happened. It frustrated me. And later to find out that Iran was holding back on retaliating against Israel for Ismail Haniyeh's assassination because they were given assurances by the U.S., that there was going to be a ceasefire agreement that's going to be signed shortly, that frustrates me. It's obvious to me that that's what was happening. And, you know, someone who understands game theory, who understands warfare, you know, you understand that your enemy sometimes is going to talk of peace while they plan for war. And that's exactly what was happening. And while the U.S. was claiming that they were going to convince the Israelis of a ceasefire, the Israelis were consistently escalating and nobody was answering to that. So they had no deterrent. There was no red lines anymore. Now, people inside Iran were extremely frustrated by the new president for having made such a mistake. And the IRGC and the under the Supreme Leader Khamenei's rule kind of pushed back against that. And I fear that given who the president, so the choice of president that came into power in Iran, and the guy behind him whose name is uh, Zarif, they are responsible for the nuclear deal. They're responsible for trying to make peace with the U.S. to the detriment of the axis of resistance. They're, they're basically trying to like get out of commitment to the axis, essentially, those people. Not saying the president, but that Zarif guy, definitely. So this is the problem that if you notice that at the same time they were talking about a nuclear deal, and they recently joined the JPOA. So I think what happened was the Americans were like, we'll do a ceasefire in Gaza. You sign a nuclear deal. All you got to do is just not answer to Israel while it's killing everybody. So that's what was happening the last few months. And that's where we got to this point where the Iranian people were extremely pissed off. And 
Nasrallah was assassinated and the Americans actually came out and said, you know what, we did our best. There's not going to be a peace treaty. We've given up. They've literally came out and said we gave up. Which is funny, like, if Iran only knew what we know, living here in the West, what we understand is that they control almost everything. The amount of leeway we have to have any agency in our own countries is minimal. And when I say they, I mean Zionists. It's a Zionist-occupied government. And fighting back is not easy. From the top to the bottom, it's not easy. We are afraid. You know, they used to tell me that I used to live in a dictatorship in Syria and that the walls can talk. I have never felt as caged as I do in the West. And I see the fear in people's eyes, you know. The problem is they don't admit it to themselves. They don't realize that they can't even see they're in a cage. At least in Syria, we know where the boundaries are, okay? It's obvious, like, okay, you don't say this against the army, for example. But here, they're deluded into believing that they live in a democracy. Prison is in their minds. Anyway, I digress. What happens now? We have Iran that they did a beautiful, like visually beautiful ballistic missile strike against Israel. Maybe did some damage. And here's the key. They wanted to tune the attack in such a way that it would cause a deterrence to Israel by creating fear, making them realize that Iran is still in the game and they're not going to get away with everything inside Lebanon. But also, they didn't want to do so much damage as to ensure that a regional war would happen. What I said to Dimitri Sims the month prior is that the problem is now that little window of retaliation is getting is shrinking where because you, you keep have to you keep having to do more, right? So the amount you do before it comes to regional war becomes smaller and smaller. It's almost like you're on the edge. You're walking on a really tight edge. And on one side is regional war, and on the other side is regional war. Because if you don't deter your enemy, you get the regional war. But if you do too much to the point where your enemy is like, well, I got to an answer to this, then you have regional war. But in my opinion, the risk is so high now that you may as well realize that there's going to be a regional war and take the initiative to start it yourself and knock out all your enemy's capabilities before it even begins. I guarantee you the Israelis are thinking the same thing. And I guarantee you the Iranians aren't. Well, it's very interesting. This is a problem. You do mention that, you know, Israel may be taken by surprise. And I think for the first time in my entire life have I seen Prime Minister Netanyahu's hand shaking when he made the announcement that Iran has made the strike and, you know, that everybody should go hide and that, you know, Israel will retaliate and respond. The first time I saw actually Netanyahu panic, and this is, you know, he was probably broadcasting out of his bunker, but his hands were visually shaking. Whether or not he faked it or not, it's unclear. But it seems that ballistic strike by Iran, whether or not it was effective or simply that it possibly was there to sort of scare the Israelis, it definitely had some sort of effect, I think, on Netanyahu, at least maybe even on his pride, because it for sure pierced the defensive shield of Israel, which it's been boasting about for so many decades, right? But again, the casualty loss, the numbers are not really given to us by Western media. So we're not actually sure exactly of which kind of targets did a strike within Israel. You know, the news is very kind of hidden about that. But it was very interesting because you mentioned the president of Iran at the moment, right? Pajeshkian, which is a very interesting man. He seems to be somewhat of a lay person in terms of Iranian, shall we say, politics or even religion. In the Shia religion, Masoud Pajeshkian, he's kind of like an outsider. He's Armenian, Azeri like not even from the main sort of group. He's not a, he's not like Ruhollah Khomeini, like a Sayyid, a descendant of Prophet Muhammad. He's not from that big family. And, you know, if you look at the, even Ali Khamenei and even people like the former president who was probably assassinated by Mossad, Ibrahim Raisi, they were all Sayyids as well, right? Of the Shia stock, descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, his granddaughter in particular, Fatima, and sorry, grandson Hussein. So they were all, Dynastically speaking, they're all members of that big noble family stemming from Muhammad. So they do have like some sort of already that birthright to rule over the Shia people. And in the same way, Sheikh Nasrallah, who was recently murdered as well, and he was also a Sayyid. And that Pazeshkian does not really have. He's almost like a, just a public servant elected to that particular position. 
which I think makes him a little bit different, but also brings in the Armenian fact. Notice how you do have the sort of Armenian dominance in a world sort of foreign affairs Syrian girl. I'm sure you've noticed how you do have people like Lavrov of Armenian stock. You do have people like Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin of Armenian Jewish descent as well. So you do have this predominance of Armenians. And even I think the fact that the Armenian overseas diaspora is strongest in France, and that's where Rukhullah Khomeini was stationed for a long time before he used his travel back to Iran during the revolution of 1979. And the fact that even Ali Khamenei mentioned the continuation of the revolution in the Shia world and even probably spreading it, right, in a form of a ideological jihad. You know, he did mention the revolution continuing, whatever that means. But I think it's interesting the point where it all stands. The axis of resistance, in a way, it probably started all the way back in 1979 when Khomeini first arrived in Iran, when the Shah was overthrown, and when essentially Iran announced itself as the first country to choose not West and not the East to break this duality of not, we're not going to be communists, we're not going to be capitalist liberals, we're going to go our own third way. I'm not saying Iran became fascist, but essentially Khomeini chose to take his country in a particular third position direction from a Muslim Shia perspective. And all the other countries yes. seem to have followed along. And that's very unique because a lot of countries around the world are now looking as well for this alternative, like, oh, we don't want to be Democrat or Republican. We don't want to be this classical right-wing liberal. We don't want to, we want to return to something else. And perhaps that's maybe that revolution that he's speaking about. Not something, not a revolution in a Marxist sense. Obviously, Khomeini was not a Marxist, but it is very interesting. And I would also add, people really don't appreciate the complexity of the Islamic world, like Sheikh Nusrallah being a Sayyid, the fact that there are literally these ancient families in all of these countries, which can trace their roots back to Prophet Muhammad himself. And the fact that you do have people from other families, which also trace their lineage really far back to literally the seventh century, like when the Eastern Roman Empire was still around, when the Byzantine Empire was still functioning and in the Eastern Mediterranean, like King Abdullah II of Jordan, I'm sure a controversial figure, but even the Hashemite kings can trace themselves back. The only, I think, dynasty which is very strange is probably the Al Saud family, right? Because they seem to have originated from seemingly nowhere. And with them, it's of course the association of Wahhabism again arises, which is a very interesting movement, probably very foreign to Syria. And of course, very disliked in Russia. In fact, all the Muslim terrorists are labeled by default Wahhabis as sort of this external movement which corrupts Russian followers of Islam. And I guess where I'm coming to is the fact that Russia's position in the Middle East has been really controversial recently. We covered it on our previous episode briefly, but the fact that there are still 20 or so Russian bases in Syria, we've seen Shoigu visit Iran twice. Of course, we've seen Mikhail Mishustin visit Iran. The ties to Iran are very, very strong. It's most likely Russia is supplying Iran, guaranteed with S-400 missile defense systems, which apparently can't even take out these F-35 fighter planes, which are Lockheed Martin stealth fighter planes, which are very powerful. Like Iran does not have this sort of air force capability that Israel now has. And it's very interesting that Russian air defense may be that one factor that essentially deters Israel from taking its planes, these stealth fighters, and actually flying them across the desert into Iran and actually making some of these key strikes that they're now doing in Syria and Lebanon. So I wonder what your assessment is of Russia's you know, predicament at the moment, Syrian girl. Should Russia engage the Israeli Air Force as it's flying these sorties and essentially terrorizing the Syrian people? Or, I mean, it's in your sort of geopolitical opinion, I'm sure we know, we'll speak about, I guess, the Russian-Israeli lobby in a moment, but just focusing on the geopolitical interests of Russia in Syria and in the Levant in general, should Russia do anything? Because it does have troops, you know, its own people are stationed on the ground there, and they're sort of in imminent danger because an accidental bombing by Israel could potentially harm, you know, Russian civilians and Russian citizens. Well, that is a very good point. And I like how you kind of separated the Israeli lobby from what Russia's actual core interests are. Well, the notion of Israel flying sorties all the way to Iran, can't imagine it actually happening because they would have to pass through Syrian air defense systems, Russian air defense systems, Iraqi air defense systems, and Iranian air defense systems. And just seems like that is a risk they're probably not going to take. And then I look at their ballistic missile th systems and they don't seem to be as good as Iran's. And the only place that they really shine is 
by means of deception, like their Mossad, their saboteurs inside Iran. That's where they shine. And it seems like most of the things that they've done thus far have been sabotage attacks, if you've noticed. Death to the president, Raisi. When Iran ditched missiles at them, they didn't ditch missiles back at Iran. They got assets inside Iran to launch a drone attack at a base that was what they described, one of their own ministers described as lame. So when it comes to their capabilities of attacking Iran directly, I'm not sure that they how much of it they have. They're able to destroy things in the region very successfully. When I say the region, I mean in the Levant. But I don't know how well they can do at a wider distance. And that's why I'm convinced that they really need America. America is the secret source to this. If it was a war between Iran and Israel, Iran would be wiped off the face of the earth. I'm sorry, I mean Israel would be wiped off the face of the earth. Israel is a one-bomb country. It's the U.S. being forced into this that is the secret source. And I think that the Israelis are probably going to wait till the elections are over. Because there's no president that's going to commit to a war with Iran while the presidential elections are still running. Which is another reason why I think they should take the initiative and start the war now. When I say they, I mean Iran needs to. But they won't, unfortunately. Because they're committed to being the righteous side. Right? Not the side that wins, just the righteous side, unfortunately. So, kind of like Imam Ali, which is the Shia, the guy that they wanted to take over after Muhammad. Yes, he was arguably, or on, I think, you know, he had a righteous reason. But did he succeed? No. This is the problem. So right does not always get you victory. I digress. I digress. So this is why I think the Israelis are going to delay their retaliation. And I think also, if you think about it, Iran strikes, I don't believe that they caused massive amounts of damage and destroyed 20 F-35s or something along those lines. But when I saw those ballistic missiles hit that base, and I remember the amount of damage that the Iranians made to the U.S. base in Iraq. If you watch the videos of those missiles hitting the airbase in the desert, you know that airbase is gone, right? Like largely. I'm sure they keep the airplanes under the ground. And I'm sure that the warheads on the missiles could have actually been larger. Now, I don't know why Iran chose the warheads that they did. I've heard it was because it makes them faster and it, it, it can like... I can change direction slightly and, and deflect away from any air defense systems. I'll have to look, in, look into it. But the warheads were not as big as they could have been. So the next one would be even bigger. Unfortunately, I think this was a much better chance to do it. But Israel is not, let's say they're going to wait to retaliate against Iran. What will they do in the meantime? Have they been deterred away from invading Lebanon? I would argue no. Have they been deterred from using bunker buster bombs? I would argue no. So the question then is, why not, like if Israel is a rational actor, which some argue it isn't, why wouldn't they just wait until they completely destroy Lebanon and then attack Iran? That way it's like they're knocking us off one by one rather than all of us uniting as one. If they were rational, that's what they would do. But we're hoping that they're actually irrational. You know, if they do something crazy in the coming days, that would be ideal because that would be the end of them. Well, I think, I mean, literally, you know, Charlton Neopitos, Elder Theodore, many other saints of orthodoxy have said that, you know, when Israel strikes the Iranian nuclear capability, that's when China and Russia will effectively be forced to respond. And you say that, you know, you make the correct comment that America is the trump card. You know, Israel obviously can't park aircraft carriers simultaneously in the Eastern Mediterranean, Persian Gulf, and Red Sea like the United States could. And neither can China and Russia, unfortunately. China, you know, is making headlines just because they have three aircraft carriers in the water at all, let alone the ability to deploy them all towards one center of conflict. But as the show is called, of course, we believe we already are in World War III. And one thing we're going to talk about here later in the episode is some of the you know, the demographics between in the Islamic world, in the Levant, in the Middle East, and we're talking about the potential of Russia getting involved here. We're talking about how Israel, you know, the ball is now in their court. The ball had kind of been in Iran's court this entire time, and we had been waiting for them to take the shot, and they finally did something, and now we are 
awaiting the likelihood of Israeli escalation. Of course, we know that people like Smotrich and Ben Yavir are going to be telling Netanyahu to go all in on everything and initiate a war with Iran effectively. Then you're going to have people like Yov Gallant and other people that are like, look, we already agreed to your invasion of Lebanon. We can't be taking this any farther. And I think the issue as well is that Trump is probably going to win at this point, in my opinion, in November. And Trump has been saying that we need to strike Iran. He's apparently furious at Biden for not wanting to strike not just the oil in Iran, but Iran's nuclear capabilities. So that's going to be a big factor on how Netanyahu is going to play this out. Perhaps he might even delay the explicit response until after the election. I could see something like that even happening. Maybe they go another round of back and forth until something like that happens. But I know you you did ask me something and I just realized I completely didn't answer you. Go ahead. So about what Russia's interests are, like it completely, I started giving you a prediction of what was going to happen, but I didn't answer you about Russia at all. So if I may briefly just take this point to answer it. If you look at things in a purely geostrategic, real politic sense, Russia would definitely benefit from siding with Iran and Syria. Why? Israel is 100% in the U.S.'s pocket and vice versa, okay? So the other thing is that Russia doesn't have any ports inside Israel. They have a military base in multiple military bases in Syria and a naval base in Tartus that allows them access to the Mediterranean Sea. They have no such access to the Mediterranean Sea from Israel. They have a long history of a trustworthy alliance with Syria. There's nothing similar to that level of a military alliance with Israel. Furthermore, the U.S. is the servant of Israel and their lobby and their politicians are completely controlled by Israel to the point that the U.S. is prepared to fall on its own sword to protect Israel. So whatever Russia wants to squeeze out of the U.S., all they need to do is put Israel under duress will fold. If, for example, recently the Russians that were saying that they were going to give Yemenis the anti-ship missiles, but then they didn't end up doing it. They say they want to give Syria stronger air defenses, but they don't end up doing it. They are doing more and more military coordinations with Iran, but then like there's some kind of a, there's a friction there where they don't fully go all in. And I think if this is a world war, as we call it, and there's two fronts then there's no sense in holding back on one of those fronts. I guarantee you, Russia could do a lot more damage to the U.S. in the Middle East than it can to do it in Ukraine, right? So they could really squeeze a lot more out of the Ukraine front by escalating the Middle East front. So why don't they do it then? Something that's so much in in Russia's interest. And in China's, by the way, because... Like Iranian oil, like China relies a lot on Iranian oil and gas. Why not do it? I suspect, unfortunately, that if there's a capitalist class inside Russia, like that is related to the fact that Russia has so many Israeli citizens, Russian speaking Israeli citizens, then they're applying too much pressure on Russia to the point where it's not really doing what is in its own interest. Similarly to the way that America is behaving in such a way that it's not doing things in its own interest for the sake of this Israeli lobby. Thank you so much for listening to the free preview of this episode of Ether Hour. Pretty long one this week. You know, this is kind of a World War Now Ether Hour hybrid. We don't even know if we're going to do World War Now properly this week. So this is kind of filling a lot of that void talking about World War III in the Middle East. So get behind the paywall to hear the full uncensored conversation with Moran. We get into some pretty great stuff regarding Syria, regarding the future of potential Golan fronts and things like that. So get behind that paywall. And thank you so much for your support. God bless. We will see you on the other side.